Hello. Right. Ancient tradition, I introduced this talk. It's been going for, what, three, four, five years now? Probably more like four. This is the traditional kernel talk by Ben Hutchings, what's new in the Linux kernel and what's missing in Debian. Please welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, let, me, let me briefly introduce myself. Um, I am a professional software developer, so I get paid to write on uh, code, get paid to work on code uh, in the day, and then I do the same thing in the evening for Debian. Uh, and I've been working on uh, the Linux kernel in both those roles for about eight years now. Uh, in my day job, mostly it's uh, uh, working on uh, extending and fixing drivers and platform code for various new and interesting devices. Uh, and in Debian, it's, it's packaging, fixing bugs, uh, pet porting security fixes, and uh, generally making the, uh, the kernel work better uh, for uh, Debian users. Um, I'm also on the long term uh, the long term support team. Uh, so uh, previously supporting the Squeeze kernel and now the Wheezy kernel uh, for five years. And I work uh, on the unstable updates for the Linux 3.2 and 3.16 branches uh, used in Wheezy and Jesse releases. Um, I work on getting those uh, updated and reviewed uh, on kernel.org. So, as you probably know, the Linux kernel is a fast-moving project. Uh, it has a release cycle of typically nine or ten weeks, so uh, it has about five releases every year. Uh, and indeed, since last year, uh, we've had another five releases, uh, 4.2 to 4.6 inclusive. So. Uh, as ever, we have new kernel features to take advantage of, uh, but in some cases we haven't yet uh, packaged or integrated the uh, user space uh, that's needed to, uh, to, to use those. Um, so firstly, I would like to have a look at some of the features I talked about last year and see um, uh, what's changed, uh, have we have we taken uh, more advantage, taken uh, advantage of those? Uh, have those been uh, uh, developed further uh, upstream? Uh, so the first thing uh, is the extended Berkeley packet filter, um, which is used for uh, filtering all kinds of things now: um, network traffic, uh, performance events, tracing events. Uh, so the, the eBPF virtual machine has been further extended to support some of those uses. We have the BPF system call that lets you create a program uh, before attaching it to any particular uh, kernel object it's going to be used with. So it has, a, has a, an independent existence. And uh, the file system for uh, keeping track of uh, data, data structures used by those programs. So. Uh, uh, used to be that a filter program would only return zero or one, saying keep or drop the packet. Um, now you can uh, you, now you can have these uh, sophisticated data structures uh, providing information back to user space. Uh, one of the problems with uh, the extended BPF is it's so powerful that you could leak uh, interesting information about what's going on in the kernel that could be useful for exploiting security bugs. Um, so last year, uh, this was only available if to, uh, to processes running as root. Uh, and I'm glad to see it, say there's now a verifier that, uh, at least in theory, is supposed to stop that sort of sensitive information leaking. Uh, and now it's safe uh, to, uh, to let all users uh, uh, use this facility. And that, that it is available to all users by default. Um, there was some work to let you write eBPF programs uh, in a subset of C and then compile it with Clang. That's now supported by the version of LLVM in Unstable. Um, however, most of the extensions aren't being widely used. I couldn't actually find any user space programs packaged in Debian that, that, uh, that use eBPF directly, but I might be mistaken. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and then, yeah, so this is a virtual machine. It's still 
the virtual machine code is still uh, interpreted by the default. There is a just in, there are just in time compilers um, that will translate the, the programs to uh, native code for certain architectures, but there have been some security concerns about those, so they're not turned on, uh, not enabled by default. There are some changes. Uh, some changes have gone in to make it um, to address the security concerns, um, but uh, so I, I hope that um, I hope we will have uh, uh, JIT enabled by default soon. Okay, so Overlay FS is the new, new or not so new anymore Union file system that's actually included in the mainline kernel. Um, so in Debian, that's effectively replaced AUFS. Uh, which we don't don't include anymore, but it has a lot of limitations. So a lot of things that AUFS can do that OAFS can't or couldn't. Um, one of those has been removed since last year. You can use NFS as the lower layer, so you can have uh, you can possibly use it as the upper layer as well. But in the the common uh, common way of using a unit file system would be to have a read only. Uh, file system on, on the lower layer that's uh, imported through NFS and then you have an upper layer that's stored locally or is just temporary. Um, that now works um, so uh, FAI and LTSP can use over the FS and, not, uh, and don't need AUFS. Um, the atomic mode setting which is, uh, provides a, uh, a better way of changing display configuration is supported in many more drivers but uh, it's not actually used. Um, even the upstream versions of Zorg and Wayland aren't using that at all. Um, so that's still uh, uh, still uh, unfinished. Uh, live patching um, had a fair amount of interest in people who would like live patching to happen. Um, who might even pay for it. Um, no one's working on it yet. Uh, there has been some progress upstream in that uh, last year we had a big major blocker which was um, needing to know when it's safe to uh, switch, to flip the switch and have uh, a process that was running the old kernel code start running the new patched uh, fixed code. Um, you can't just do that at any point. It might be right in the middle of that old code uh, and very bad things would happen if it ran a mixture of old and new code. So you need to have some way of detecting what's the safe point to switch over. Uh, and that turns out to require a whole lot of work uh, to understand the uh, 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 where each task is in um, uh, logically in the in the kernel code. And that's been done, but uh, no one has actually started working on life patching in Debian. It would be nice if someone did. And I certainly don't have the time to do it, I'm afraid. Um, so non-volatile dims are uh, this new kind of super fast flash storage, uh, which has uh, RAM in front of it. Uh, they plug into dim slots like regular dims on an appropriately, uh, on, on, on in computers that support this. Um, and the uh, one of the one of the neat things you can do with this is um, directly map that uh, flash storage or uh, flash backed memory uh, into a process. Uh, you can memory map a file and not have any sort of buffering in uh, system memory. That's called uh, the that's called DAX. Last year we, uh, we had support for that in X2 and X4 file systems. Now we have it in XFS as well. We also have some kernel infrastructure for configuring DIMMs, uh, NV DIMMs. You can um, you can use part of them as uh, in a, in a RAM-like mode, and part of them in a uh, in a, in a more disk-like mode. Um, but you um, you need some way to configure to sort of partition the uh, the uh, the memory. And this is a lower level than the usual uh, partition uh, labels that you would write with, say, FDisk or Parted. So you, you, need, uh, you need the NDCTL uh, program to configure this. 
which is not yet packaged. So I opened an RFP bug. Um, I'm not going to work on it again. I don't have any non-volatile volatile DIMMs or, or uh, computers I could plug them into. But uh, the, hopefully someone, someone wants this and we'll, uh, we'll get that package. Um, and there's the file system level encryption in X4, which is kind of a, someone's waving at me. Do you want to talk? Got a microphone? I wanted to be supported in part, man, so I, I was interested in doing it already, the X4 encryption. Now, um, I believe uh, Ubuntu has had support for doing uh, eCryptFS uh, set up in the installer for quite a while. Is that something that, that uh, could be built on to do the same thing with the X4 encryption, or is it too different, do you think? They're similar. X4 encryption is better. I, I realize that there's a... There's a uh, I realize there are advantages. I was interested in um, with the process of setting it up be similar enough to somewhat so you want to work on that yeah yeah great um, so Intel MPX this is the uh, memory protection extensions which is uh, the main, main part of that is uh, being able to do uh, array bounds checking uh, very cheaply in hardware uh, uh, which could allow for uh, generating safer code for C and some other languages. Well, generating safer code for C and perhaps more efficient uh, native code from Java and, and other languages that require bounds checking. Um, so we have support for that in GTC and glibc now. Um, I don't know whether anything else ought to be done there, whether there's something that uh, we could actually uh, start generating that code. Um, I suspect not because new instructions are, are just going to crash on older processes. So that's going to be difficult to take advantage of in Debian as opposed to in, uh, uh, in custom built programs running on Debian. But we've got the infrastructure there at least. Um, batch network transmit uh, is a nice little optimization for uh, tra transmitting at high packet rates. Um, that needs support in each driver, it supports in more drivers. Nothing needs to be done in user space, so uh, that's all good. And then uh, year 2038 compliance on those two-bit architectures. Um, I'm sure most of us will have got rid of our 32-bit systems by 2038, but uh, there are probably going to be embedded systems made in the next few years. Uh, and using those stupid architectures for various reasons that will still be in use in 2038. Um, and at that point, sorry, I won't go back a bit. The usual Unix representation of time uh, on a those stupid architecture is a those stupid signed value, and the largest time value that that can represent is sometime in early 2038. So uh, all kinds of time handling code is going to break beyond that point if it's still using 32-bit. Uh, uh, time values. So um, there's there'll still been a, there's been a fair amount of discussion, fair amount of uh, some ideas tried out. Uh, nothing has actually changed yet. Uh, I really hope that's going to get fixed in the next year or two. Um, and I believe uh, it is going to require fixes at the application level to actually. Uh, uh, you to, or at least in the uh, build process, in the same way that you have to opt into large file support, you will probably have to opt into large time support. Uh, but yeah, as, as it is, there is no, there's no new uh, API to opt into, so nothing for users allowed to do yet. So onto the new new features that have been added in the last uh, in the last year. Um, so control groups, or C groups for short, are the mechanism for uh, limiting resource usage in containers or even smaller groups of processes. Um, one of the things that we've not been able to do well with uh, containers is to limit, uh, uh, limit what they're doing with write back. 
So I'm sure you, you know that uh, when a process uh, writes to a file, uh, that doesn't it doesn't have to wait for that for the data to go to to be written to physically to disk. Usually, um, it goes into a buffer and gets written back later. Uh, and sometimes it's possible to build up very large amounts of write buffers uh, that take a long time to uh, to flush out to disk. And that's bad. Uh, it's particularly bad if you end up using up huge, a large amount of your memory with write buffers. Um, and one of the problems with controlling this with C groups has been, uh, by the time that I/O is done, it's no longer it no longer has anything to do with the process that generated the that made it necessary. Uh, the write buffers are kind of uh, um, there's kind of a there's global control of write back, but there's no um, uh, that's about it. So the block IO controller couldn't share out bandwidth between different processes. It didn't know about the processes. And the memory controller um, couldn't uh, slow down, throttle the, uh, the processes that were uh, writing too much, or writing more than their fair share, uh, because it just doesn't, didn't know anything about what was going on with block IO. Uh, it sort of, there were, I believe there was some code in the memory controller too that attempted to do this, but it didn't have enough information to do it properly. Now we have a write-back controller that is properly integrated with memory and, uh, and block IO systems, and uh, that should do a much better job. Uh, unfortunately, it requires specific, it needs some help from the file system um, that's supported in ButterFS and ext4, uh, but not yet in XFS. So. That's something to bear in mind when setting up uh, container hosts, perhaps. Uh, and there's another teeny controller, PIDs controller, does something fairly simple, uh, limits the number of uh, PIDs uh, you, you can have in a, in a control group, which essentially means it limits the, uh, the limits of the number of threads that can be running in there. And that's important mostly because we, we uh, limit the number of uh, PIDs uh, in a namespace to 30,767, which is a tiny number. Uh, we could actually make it much larger, but there are some compatibility reasons uh, why that isn't done by default. Um, yeah. So another thing that's some another feature that's somewhat useful for dealing with containers, uh, but also immediately for dealing with virtual machines. This needs a bit of an explanation. Um, all, all memory that's not uh, mapped from a file uh, is called anonymous, um, and that can be written out to swap. Um, so, and all the uh, basically all the memory that's used by a virtual machine is anonymous. Uh, that so if you uh, migrate the VM, all of that has to be moved to the uh, to the new VM host. Uh, because it's not, it's, not in, uh, it's not in shared storage. Like, for example, a virtual disk would typically, if you're going to do live migration of a VM, you'll typically need to have its disk in, in shared storage that can be accessed from both the uh, original and new um, VM host. So for all that anonymous memory, you need to copy it in some way. And there are two broad, uh, two broad strategies for doing that. The first one called pre-copy is what is normally done now. Uh, you start uh, start copying the pages that that the uh, VM is not uh, not writing to, and uh, so copy all the data you can. At the same time, the VM is still running. Uh, you'll need to keep you'll need to copy all the pages that it modifies. At some point, uh, you can detect you have to detect that. It's dirtying pages faster than you can copy them. At that point, you freeze it, copy the remaining pages, and restart it, resume it on the new VM host. And that can actually take a very long time. Um, uh, if the VM is, is writing to, uh, is running across a large amount of memory. So an alternate way of, uh, of copying is post copy, which is you uh, freeze a VM right away, you copy a minimal set of its memory, uh, 
start it again, and you, then you copy the uh, remaining memory, uh, prioritizing all the pages that it needs uh, right away. Uh, but in order to do that, you need to have some way of of getting the uh, having the VM um, get a page fault for these missing pages, and then instead of trying to read in from the swap file because the, those pages aren't in the swap file on the destination host, uh, you, you need to intercept those and copy from the uh, original host. So the user fault FD uh, system call and some ioctals that you can uh, run on that file descriptor. Um, are, are the mechanism by which uh, a, a virtual machine manager can implement post copy. And QMU KVM uh, does now use this. I think, I don't know whether that's done by default or, uh, or whether you have to opt into it, but it's there, uh, I believe, in Unstable. Uh, the CRIU, that's uh, Checkpoint and Restore in User Space. Uh, project which can do live migration of containers. Um, we'll probably use this in the future, but I believe it needs a few more uh, extensions. Because uh, there are slightly different considerations. Uh, there's some more complexities when, when copying a group of processes rather than the single, rather than the virtual machine, which is a single process. Um, now we have lightweight tunnels. This is a networking feature. Uh, currently, if you create a network tunnel, usually you have to create a tunnel device which has configuration of uh, where that uh, tunnel goes to uh, and what kind of encapsulation is used in the tunnel. Uh, and then separately, you have to create a route on top of that. Uh, so that's the, the configuration is spread across two different objects in the kernel. And the kernel is actually pretty good at handling thousands or uh, thousands and thousands of routes, uh, but devices are relatively heavyweight, and the kernel and user, uh, user space uh, management tools uh, uh, don't deal so well with having lots and lots of devices. So in, in a certain virtualization uh, hosting uh, configurations, you actually want to have lots and lots and lots of tunnels. Um, so light, the new lightweight tunnels allow you to do, uh, configure the, the tunnel as part of the route. Um, if the tunnel doesn't need a, a whole lot of state, then all you need to do is specify the destination and the encapsulation as part of the route. Um, uh, there are several different encapsulations that are supported with this. Um, not... Um, I don't think you can use this for things like VPNs, but then you wouldn't need thousands of VPNs, hopefully. Uh, so this needs a newer version of the IP route 2 utility to configure it. Uh, uh, so uh, Debian is a bit behind there. Uh, I might fix that bug myself, but uh, if anyone else is interested in this, uh, I believe that's in collab mains, and uh, it's open to anyone to update that, update IP route 2. Uh, so ARM, um, or ARM HS specifically, you've got a nice bit of uh, and got a nice security mitigation. Um, the there are specific uh, safe functions that the kernel is supposed to use whenever it copies data between uh, user space and kernel space, and if it doesn't do that, um, it's a bug. Uh, it might be a bug with uh, quite serious security impact. Um, so uh, this is a known problem. There are mitigations against it in GL security. Um, there are also hardware mitigations against this. Um, Intel has implemented something they call supervisor mode access protection, and ARM has done has a privileged access never. And the kernel can take advantage of those features, which turns that sort of bug uh, makes that bug, bug sorry it makes that class of bug less serious. Uh, you'll get an oops, possibly the kernel will crash completely, possibly the process will it'll be just that process that's killed. But it's still not as bad as uh, uh, having someone able to take over the kernel completely. Um, so the Debian ARM HF uh, architecture is built for ARM v7, which does not have this feature. It's, I think it was added in version 8.1 of the architecture. Um, so even ARM64 doesn't have it, it doesn't. Um, not even all ARM64 processes have it. Uh, however, 
there's a, a there wasn't previously unused feature of memory management domains, uh, which turns out to be usable to do the same thing uh, or very similar uh, with a, uh, with a bit of software configuration. So that's that's enabled by default. Um, so um, so Debian ARM systems are just a little bit more a little bit more uh, secure. <coughs> So yeah, reproducible builds. It uh, turns out that some people had been thinking about this uh, uh, upstream already. And if you just set the uh, environment variable k build build timestamp, then it will then the kernel build will use that instead of the current time, and you get perfectly reproducible uh, kernel image and modules. What hadn't been covered was documentation. Um, that uh, I mean. Very uh, differences in the documentation from build to build uh, probably don't mean you should be worried about uh, about it being exploited by by uh, by uh, wrong documentation. But anyway, we uh, several people worked on the doc, uh, fixing the reproducibility of the documentation in Debian. Uh, submitted the, those changes upstream; they've all been accepted. Uh, so that's that's fixed. Um, Raspberry Pi, um, for anyone who hasn't heard of Raspberry Pi, um, I don't know where you've been, but uh, there's a series of low-cost development boards um, uh, that use uh, the video core SOCs made by Broadcom. Um, the, the, these are basically meant for doing uh, video processing, image processing, um, using the video core architecture, which is proprietary. Uh, but they, all, all of these SOCs also contain uh, one or more ARM cores. Um, and the default OS for these dev boards has been uh, the Raspbian uh, Debian derivative. Um, there were a couple of reasons for that, uh, for not using uh, stock Debian. One of those has been uh, that the mainline kernel did not, uh, didn't support uh, these SOCs. Um, there are a lot of uh, a lot of extra drivers and platform code uh, that needs to go into mainline. Uh, thankfully, that's been done over the last four years. The uh, graphics driver has been rewritten to run um, uh, on the ARM core rather than on the uh, video core. Um, and the Raspberry Pi 2 is supported uh, in Debian uh, on testing and unstable. Uh, the Pi 1 can't be supported because it only has a V6 processor, or we could support it with ARM EL, but I don't think anyone would be, inter would be very interested in that. And the Pi 3 is a, has 64-bit ARM, but uh, the firmware at the moment tries to boot a 32-bit kernel. So I don't think we'll be very interested in that until, uh, until we can run proper 64-bit code. Um, so the the uh, Linux Foundation Linux Foundation has been uh, has started a project called Kernel Self Protection Project, uh, which aims to uh, uh, add some security mitigations into the kernel um, because it's written in the C language. There will always be uh, there are always going to be bugs uh, that allow for memory corruption and potentially uh, compromise the security of the kernel. Um, there's not much we can do uh, to uh, to stop that, uh, other than rewriting it in a safe language, which is not going to happen anytime soon. It won't be, uh, and if it does happen, that won't be Linux anymore. But it'll be an interesting project. There is actually a, uh, there's a project to write a new kernel in Rust. Should be very interesting. Maybe have a go at Demi import to it someday. Um, anyway. Uh, Working with uh, with Linux, um, we need uh, some sort of uh, mitigations against the, the, those bugs that will inevitably occur. So the PAX and GL security projects have, have done a lot of work in this uh, in this area, but unfortunately have had quite strained relations with uh, mainline kernel developers. So there are a lot of features that have been developed um, separately uh, that, that have never gone into mainline Linux. This. Uh, uh, project is a, an attempt to uh, get as many of those features as possible, uh, or at least the most important features uh, brought into mainline Linux. Um, 
and it's making somewhat slow progress, but uh, there are a couple of a uh, couple of things that have already gone in. Uh, firstly, to reduce the amount of writable data, uh, there are a lot of uh, data structures in the kernel that contain uh, contain function pointers. If you can write to find a bug that lets you write to one of those, then uh, you can redirect code flow, um, and that obviously would be a bad thing. Uh, so more more architectures are now uh, write protecting all the data that that doesn't need to be written to, and there's a new way, uh, new option to make more data write protectable uh, if it's if it's not um, statically initialized but just needs a little bit of code to initialize it once it, then it can, then it can be made read only afterwards. Uh, and then the page poisoning feature. Uh, this was something that was actually already available as a debug feature, but it was uh, bundled with some other uh, uh, debugging checks so that it was uh, had quite a significant performance impact. So the idea, so there's now an option to enable just the, uh, just what's necessary for security mitigation that doesn't uh, slow things down as much. Uh, and that might be maybe something we could turn on um, in the Debian kernel configuration. I have to think about it, maybe do some measurements of that. Uh, and some of, the, some of the hardening features that have been implemented uh, uh, by those uh, projects have used GCC plugins. Uh, a GCC plugin can uh, implement new extensions to the C language and then uh, systematically do interesting things with the generated code um, or, or make sort of logical changes to the code before it goes through, um, uh, before it uh, gets translated into machine code. Uh, so that's, I think the plugin infrastructure is included in Linux, will be included in Linux 4.7, and then after that, hopefully, we'll get some more interesting uh, 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 hardening features building on that in later releases. Uh, the real-time Linux uh, project uh, is another thing that's unfortunately uh, outside of mainline Linux. Uh, it's trying to keep close to uh, mainline though. So that adds a uh, compile time option uh, to limit scheduling latency, which is basically what, uh, basically what uh, real-time is about. Um, it's important. Some people think that real time, uh, running real time Linux means they get lower latency, and that's not generally the case. It actually tends to increase the average latency. The, the important thing about real time is that the uh, maximum latency is uh, is 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 uh, limited, and um, laten that there's a lot less jitter. But the latency of responding to events is predictable. Um, so yeah, it's a long-lived fork, but a lot of a lot of the uh, changes that have been made on that fork have been have gone into mainline. So the difference from mainline uh, uh, is something like 300 patches, which sounds like a lot, but a fair number of them are tiny bug fixes to make drivers work with real time. Um, it's had uh, intermittent funding, I would say. Uh, currently, the Linux Foundation is paying the. Thomas Likes, now who's been one of the main real-time developers for years, he's, been, he's now, uh, uh, I think, has uh, paid full time to work on that. And a couple of changes uh, from real-time have gone into mainline recently. Um, the, uh, so the timer wheel is, uh, is a structure that, that keeps track of all the timeouts that the kernel looks after. There are huge numbers of timeouts with things like sockets and, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, basically, this is about limiting the amount of time that can be sp that uh, <coughs> that um, the um, any operation on that will take. Uh, CPU hot plug is C so CPU hot plug is actually used for things like suspending or um, power management, not just for uh, turning off the entire system or for um, actually physically unplugging a, a CPU. Uh, so CPU hot plug is something that does, uh, that isn't such an unusual operation. And um, 
as it is, uh, it, it can take a very long time, but basically unbounded time to complete. Um, and uh, so that's, uh, that, that was a problem for real time Linux. Um, and so this is gradually, gradually moving towards maybe someday being an, op an option for a mainline. Uh, and finally, um, let's run, quickly run through the changes that we've made to packaging in the last year. Uh, uh, the binary packages are reproducible, uh, at least when you use the um, the reproducible build, uh, at least on the reproducible builds infrastructure where they've made, modified dpackage and a few other things. Um, there's a stage one build profile uh, which can be used for architecture bootstrapping. Uh, that just builds the Linux libc dev package. The Linux tools package um, was separated out, mostly because it didn't support cross-building, uh, whereas the Linux source package did. Uh, I've now folded those together and added a build profile so that you can build just, you can do a cross-build of Linux. In fact, I've also implemented cross-building of most of the uh, user space uh, packages as well. Um, they, um, so the Linux package has a whole lot of configuration in the source package to define what, which binaries will be produced and to uh, adjust the configuration uh, in complicated ways. Uh, and I've now added some uh, options there so you can turn off generating binaries, uh, various sorts of binaries. Um, which is useful if you want to build a derivative like uh, Linux GRSec. That, uh, that's uh, basically the, the same as the Linux packaging with a couple of switches turned off, so it doesn't build binaries that will conflict uh, with, the, with those built by the Linux source package. Um, that might also be friendly, uh, might also be something that's useful for uh, derivative distributions if they have their, uh, reasons for building uh, some extra configurations. Um, uh, I've done a lot of preparation for supporting secure boot. Uh, modules are now getting signed, although only with my key, not with the archive key um, at the moment. Uh, the kernel images get signed, uh, and we have the secure level patches that, uh, that block off uh, other ways of inserting, uh, inserting unsigned code into the kernel. Um, we're building the uh, user space lock depth and uh, CPU power packages. Um, and I've uh, changed the way that the uh, drivers are packaged for inclusion in the installer. So instead of having, uh, uh, having to list all the individual drivers and maybe leaving some of them out so that you find that, oh, this kernel runs on my, my machine, but, but the drivers I need aren't there at installation time. So how am I supposed to install it? Uh, that's now hopefully fixed uh, because the drivers are, in, are included by directory name and the drivers are organized in the kernel source by, uh, by directory. So um, all network drivers are together, for example. And so um, we've unfortunately had to drop support. Well, not had to, but we have dropped support for some older uh, processors. Uh, 586 isn't supported, the minimum is a 686 for some definition of 686, which is I'm not going to go into right now. Um, we're just about to drop support for MIPS R1 processors, um, which unfortunately means the Lungsen 2 E and F are gone. Um, and I rewrote the horribly complicated Perl maintainer scripts. Um, so, uh, well, I actually we put uh, a lot of complexity into a new Perl script in Linux space, but it's still much nicer, I, I claim. Um, uh, so the, the scripts that are in the Linux source package are pretty simple now. And that's it. Well, there were a lot of other changes that were too small to mention, but uh, that's, uh, that's all I uh, thought worth noting today. So uh, any questions? Microphone. Uh, hello. I missed the beginning. I don't know if you had a word on that, but uh, they need RunFS tools. What are the plans for this? 
and or, or moving into Draycat or keeping those or what is there? What's um, the future of that? That's not really in the scope of this talk, um, but I think um, I'm happier about maintaining the init round fest tools. I would also be quite happy if Drake could replace it. Um, um, but I think uh, init round fest tools in, is in fairly good shape now. Um, and um, there's no urgent need to switch over. But if we could share uh, share Drake with, uh, with, all, uh, with other distributions, um, then that might be good. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't go to the Drake at, uh, talk earlier. I, uh, I would hope, hope to, but I couldn't. Um, so um, yeah, I can't, I can't give a definite answer to your question. Must be more questions. Thank you. Oh. <laughs>